scripture verse for the text, the one you might focus on is Esther chapter 1 verse 22. The Bible says, For he sent letters into all the king's provinces, into every province, according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language, that every man should bear rule in his own house, and that it should be published according to the language of every people. The confessional reading is the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 1, section 1. The confession says, Although the light of nature and the works of creation and providence do so far manifest the goodness, wisdom, and power of God as to leave men inexcusable, yet are they not sufficient to give that knowledge of God and of His will which is necessary unto salvation. Therefore it pleased the Lord at sundry times and in divers manners to reveal Himself and to declare His will unto His church, and afterwards for the better preserving and propagating of the truth, and for the more sure establishment and comfort of the church against the corruption of the flesh, and of the malice of Satan, and of the world, to commit the same holy underwriting, which maketh the holy scripture to be most necessary, those former ways of God, revealing his will unto his people, now ceased. That was the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 1, article 1. Now the sermon. The introduction. The book of Esther is one special part of Holy Scripture. Because the book of Esther is part of Holy Scripture, then it follows that it is most necessary for preserving and propagating the truth of God, the truth that God would have his people to know and to believe. The book of Esther is also necessary in establishing the certain comfort and assurance of God's precious saints. Now, beloved, the book of Esther takes place during the Babylonian captivity of Israel. Previously to this captivity, the Hebrew nation had turned from God's law. When the apostasy happened, the Lord sent prophets to Israel, confronting them, saying, If they will not obey, I will utterly pluck up and destroy that nation. Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 17. The Lord told them plainly, I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in the land which thou knowest not, for ye have kindled a fire in my anger. Jeremiah 17, verse 4. Even so, Israel would not repent from their evil. So the Lord said, They shall be carried to Babylon, and there shall they be until the day that I visit them, saith the Lord. Then will I bring them up and restore to this place. Jeremiah 27, verse 22. And so Jehovah destroyed Israel, killed a great many of its wicked citizens, and scattered the rest throughout the many nations of the Persian Empire. This is when the book of Esther takes place, during the Babylonian captivity. The book of Esther is a timely message for God's people in this nation today. For our country has wickedly rejected God's moral law, despised his holy scripture, and mocked those who call them to repentance. Unless there is a great revival, a great spiritual awakening across our land, or unless the second coming is about to take place, for we believe in the imminent return of Christ, then this republic will surely be destroyed, and its people sent into captivity. The book of Esther suddenly becomes of great interest those who find themselves slaves in a strange land. Part 1. The Bible says, Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus, this is Ahasuerus, which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over a hundred and seven and twenty provinces, that in those days when the king, Ahasuerus, sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shishan, the palace, in the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all his princes and his servants, the power of Persia and Media, the nobles and princes of the provinces being before him. 
when he showed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty many days, even a hundred and four score days, and when these days were expired, the king made a feast unto all the people that were present in Shushan, the palace, both unto the great and small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace, where were white, green, blue hangings, fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rings and pillars of marble. The beds were of gold and silver upon a pavement of red and blue and white and black marble. Book of Esther, chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. So the history begins with the king, Ahasuerus, who we find to be the ruler of the Persian Empire. He is king over 127 provinces. And he has his headquarters, his palace, located in the royal city of Shushan. Now, beloved, if you have read a little bit of political history, then you know that sinful man has invented many foolish ideas on how a man comes to rule a nation or an empire. Despite such nonsense, Hasuerus did not become king of this empire by chance, nor by the power of his own hand, for the Bible says... God is the judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. Psalm 75, verse 7. God states, I gave thee a king in my anger and took him away in my wrath. Hosea chapter 13, verse 11. This is the absolute predestination of God. The Bible tells us that in God's eyes, all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth and none can stay his hand or say unto him what doest thou Daniel chapter 4 verse 35 the reason Ahasuerus was chosen to be king as it will become ever more clear throughout the book of Esther is the salvation of God's elect and the destruction of the reprobate Every act found in history, whether it be good or bad, works for the salvation of God's elect. The Bible says, We know that all things work together for the good to them that love God and to them who are called according to His purpose. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Not only acts in general, but even particular acts of evil towards God's elect work to accomplish the salvation of the elect and the destruction of the reprobate. The Bible says, Whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. No weapon formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Isaiah 54, verses 15 through 17. So we're talking about the absolute predestination of God. You'll see it all throughout this book. So Ahasuerus was raised up to be king of Persia for the same reason. Pharaoh was made king of Egypt. Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Romans chapter 9 verse 17. Thus, knowing that God has determined all things, knowing that God infallibly brings to pass whatsoever he has planned for his own glory and for the salvation of his people, we can have a certain assurance and comfort that even in the worst possible situation, Jehovah will save and preserve us while simultaneously destroying his enemies. Beloved, we shall see all of this unfold by the time we reach the end of the book of Esther. As for right now, King Ahasuerus has thrown a great feast for his nobles, showing them the riches of his kingdom. Then in the court of the garden of the king's palace, another great feast was given for all those in Shushan, both great and small, rich and poor, also showing them many magnificent riches of the palace. It is at the end of this feast when things start to get interesting. 
For God is governing the events of this feast for the good of his people. What, my, uh, what may seem to be unimportant to the casual observer soon proves to be the starting point of a series of unforgettable events. Part 2. The Bible says, And they gave them drink in vessels of gold, the vessels being diverse one from another, and royal wine in abundance according to the state of the king. And the drinking was according to the law, None did compel, for so the king had appointed to all the officers of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure. Also Vashti the queen was made a feast for the women in the royal house, which belonged to the king Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was merry with wine, and he commanded Mahuman, Bistha, Harbona, Bigtha, and Abagtha, Sether, and Carcass, and the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus the king to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown of royal to show the people and the princes her beauty for she was fair to look upon but the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains therefore was the king very wroth and his anger burned in him Esther chapter 1 verses 7 through 12 in this passage, we see, we see the king and the queen each having a separate feast. The king is entertaining the men while the queen is having another feast for the women. Drinking was certainly involved at the king's feast, but it was carried out according to the law. No one, it, no one in attendance was compelled to drink against his own will. If one were to become inebriated, then it was according to his own desires. Wouldn't you know it, on the seventh day of the feast, the king has come under the influence of wine. He is merry. He is very merry with wine. And he has now entered into his mind to present his wife, the queen, before the people. The king wishes to show the people the beauty of his queen. However, when the queen refused to come to her king, then the king became greatly enraged. The king's wife has now publicly disobeyed her husband, the king, before the watching eyes of his mighty empire. Part 3. The Bible says, Then the king said to the wise men, which knew the times, for so was the king's manner towards all that knew law and judgment. And the next unto him was Karshina, Shathar, Admatha, Tarshish, Marys, Marcina, and Mukin the seven princes of Persia and Media, which saw the king's face, and which sat the first in the kingdom. What shall we do unto the queen Vashti according to the law? Because she hath not performed the commandment of the king, Ahasuerus, by the chamberlains. And Mamukin answered before the king and the princes, Vashti the queen has not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes, and to all the people that are in all the provinces of the king. Ahasuerus. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes. When it shall be reported, the king Ahasuerus commanded Vashti the queen to be brought in before him, but she came not. Likewise shall the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes, which have heard, the, heard of the deed of the queen. Thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. Esther chapter 1 verses 13 through 18. Here we see that the king and his advisors now come to consider the behavior of Queen Vashti. What is to be thought of a man who is the ruler of 127 provinces yet cannot be the ruler of his own house? Cannot even rule over his own wife? What is to be thought of such a man? Sinful kings with all of their power and riches, are incapable of conquering the heart of a single sinner. Only Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, is able to accomplish that feat. Now in her pride, Queen Vashti disobeyed her king during a feast given for the very purpose of displaying the king's rule over his vast empire. 
The king's advisors pointed out that Queen Vashti's behavior sets an immoral precedent, not only to the prince's wives, but to the wives of all men within the empire. And they were correct in pointing this out, for the Bible says, Wives, submit, your, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be to their own husbands in everything. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 24. The king's advisors reasoned that when the other wives of the empire hear of the queen's bold defiance of her husband, then they too will use her example as a basis to despise their own husbands. This will lead inevitably to much hostility between husbands and wives. In other words, Queen Vashti's disobedience is an attack on the institution of the family. That a man should rule his house well and that a wife should obey her husband is a divine command found throughout God's word. The Lord speaks of Abraham saying, For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord, to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. Genesis chapter 18 verse 19. The Bible says, Likewise, ye wives be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they may also find without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. For after this manner in the old times, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and not, and not afraid with any amazement. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1. Verses 5 through 6. As all men have the work of the law naturally written upon their hearts from birth, it is not surprising to find pagan empires teaching this moral command as well. The Persians were correct in thinking that a ruler's immorality is an example to the people on how they should act. Those in authority, those in government, should be careful on, how, on their behavior, especially in public for it is the object of many discussions. Consider how the immorality of our own politicians and so-called movie stars and sports stars impact popular society. Immoral politicians would not have been tolerated in the old days of the United States of America. Now politicians boldly refuse to step down from office whenever exposed in scandalous affairs, even when their own constituents demand it. In the old days, they would have resigned out of shame. Such wicked leaders, and they are a dime a dozen today, are punishment from God on a wicked nation that cares nothing for the morality of the Bible. Can anyone find a female politician, business leader, or university professor that is morally upright, submissive, and obedient to her husband? We know before asking that such a woman does not exist in the realm of Hollywood. But, never, but nevertheless, these are the teachers of our young women today. Our young girls are everywhere exposed to ungodly women who despise the Bible and biblical morality. Even so, when a young girl reads from the Bible that a wife is to be obedient to her husband or hears this teaching in some good sermon, then what is she to think when she sees her own mother disobey her father time and again, day in and day out? Are the fathers and mothers not the most frequent and common examples of morality for their children? Little ones are always watching. God has called the wife to be submissive and obedient to her husband. That such a command is constantly opposed by the sinful nature of fallen women, it cannot be denied. Only a woman motivated by the gospel of Jesus Christ can hope to submit and obey her husband according to the law. Now consider for a moment how Christ submitted to the humiliation and death of the cross for our sins. How Christ obeyed God's law perfectly in our stead. Then knowing our sins... 
having been forgiven, strive to be cheerfully submissive and obedient in order to show gratitude and thanksgiving for the great salvation Christ has won for all women who love and trust in his gospel. Do not think that such a work is unimportant, for the book of Esther clearly teaches that the submissive and obedient wife can change the course of history, save the lives of thousands, and even destroy the enemies of God. But even if the submissive and obedient servant of God never becomes world famous, do not think for a moment that such a person is unimportant. There are no little people in God's eyes. God is well pleased with the lowly wife who cheerfully submits and obeys her husband, while God is angry with the powerful female politician who disregards her, his commands. It's a great honor and vocation to be a godly wife and mother. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the word of God, which you have provided for us to teach us all truth that you would have us to know. Lord, we thank you for godly women who strive to keep your commandments, to glorify and honor you. We ask, Father, that you give us great strength and grace, a great heart that desires to be obedient to your will, motivated by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask that just give us strength to love one another and be gracious to one another. And so, Father, we ask that your will be done according to all that your scripture has promised. Lord, we ask that you protect each and every one of us as we go out through this week. Be with us, Father. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.